Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Greg Good. A lot of G's in that sentence. Uh, <laughs> so welcome, Greg. Good to meet you. Nice to be speaking to you, too. Yeah. Greg and I almost did this interview about a year ago, and um, then somehow there were technical difficulties with equipment and, and so on. We almost did it last week, and my computer was on the blink. Um, I've got a new one coming. Um, and But here we are, and it's working well now. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Me too. Yeah. Um, Greg, uh, I'll just read a little bit of your bio here, and then you can embellish it if you like. Uh, Greg has been a philosophical counselor since 1996 and has extensive experience with online consultation. He got his Ph.D. from the University of Rochester, and despite that qualification, he has not been saying, would you like fries for that for in recent years. Um, it happens. It, it does it. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, but Greg is an IT professional, and he is also a philosophical counselor. So uh, I, until I read about you, heard about you, I had never known that there was such a thing as a philosophical counselor, uh, and probably most other people don't either. Can you can you tell us what a philosophical counselor is and does? Yeah, it's sort of a new. It's a revisitation of one of the world's oldest professions. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard of the book called Plato, Not Prozac? I think I have, but I haven't read it. That's by a colleague of mine called, huh. uh, named Lou Marinoff, uh -huh. and it's basically uh, used some of the great philosophical resources as a way to look into things that you might be interested in, mm -hmm. and it's a, sort of a form of, of therapy, not psychological therapy so much, but uh, therapy in a way of looking at the questions of life. Hmm. So it might not have the immediate effect of making you feel better that moment, or it might, but its purpose is to provide insight into how you would live life. Yeah. And so that became a profession. That sort of uh, kicked off other books and other people. They saw uh, Lou Marinoff doing that and said, well, I can do that too. And then an association formed and several associations formed. Now there are many, many large countries have their own philosophical practitioners association. And, hmm. and uh, actually... Most of my consultations or interactions with people don't come from that uh, that group or that discourse at all. They come from the same non-dual groups that we both know. Mm -hmm. So, as an example uh, of this, let's you want say me to give, I can have a good okay, example. You give of, an example, of, sure. Of the questions that they normally ask, which uh -huh. I never, I've only gotten maybe two in in like five years. Two questions two, or two versions of this kind of question. Okay. Um, what should I do with my life? Should I should I go to graduate school or should I get a job? Mm -hmm. That's one question, you know. Um, or should I quit school because it doesn't look promising? I want to start working. That's another version. Hmm. Uh, here's uh, ethical dilemmas are a big uh, question for that for that profession as well. Here's one question that comes up several times. I'm friends with my boss at work, and w I've gone to say his or her house several times I've met his or her family. They're happy. It's Everything's good. And then one day I see my boss at the mall hugging another person. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they're romantically involved on the side. Mm -hmm. My ethical dilemma is, should I tell my boss or not? Right. And so since that seems like a thorny issue, it's not, ju it's not a psychological issue. It's not something you would ask a therapist or a psych psycho psychoanalyst. Oh, they ask your handy philosopher, your philosophical <laughs> consultant, and so that's a that's a. Uh, I guess the most common genre of questions that that profession would get would be ethical dilemmas. And I'm guessing that you don't have pat black and white answers to questions like that. You kind of probe more deeply with the person. And you do, you do, yeah. because it sort of depends on what theory of ethics you like, what your what you, you know. Different philosophers, of course, have many different opinions and, and ideas about these things. So you sort of get a feeling for what ethical orientation a person feels comfortable with, mm -hmm. and you go forth in that, in that direction. Yeah. It's interesting. So, you know, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It, it, like in, this, you know, in the non-dual area, that, that particular question wouldn't come up as much. Right. Um, I did have one question that, uh, from a person who said, uh, a son of, kind of a related question. They wanted to learn um, the 
kind of non-dualism that someone like uh, Ramesh Balsakar teaches, which is uh, there's no free will, mm -hmm. so the author of all is consciousness or God. Mm -hmm. And so one feels instantly released from all questions of guilt and pride and uh, shame, perhaps, things like that. Because this person, this particular uh, consultee, had someone that he was uh, had a crush on outside of his marriage. Uh -huh. And he wanted to feel guilt-free about pursuing it. <laughs> yeah. So he thought, oh, if I could learn the non-doership stuff, I'd feel okay about it, and then I could proceed. Not only that, but he could rob banks on the side, you know, and make Right. And I told him to fix up his, his, uh, his marriage, you know, come yeah. to some sort of uh, equilibrium about that, and then get back in touch with me. It's an interesting, uh, interesting topic, which I hope we'll, we'll get into during the course of the interview, the whole thing about what is really meant by non-doership, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it, I, I believe it applies to a level of life that uh, does, it, it's, it's a different realm, so to speak, than, you know, your relationship with your wife or your girlfriend or all those things. Those, there are certain principles or, or rules or values which apply on the relative level, which might be mm -hmm. completely transcendent on the absolute level, but each level has its own significance. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah, sure. We'll sure. get into that. Um, so, do you mind, I mean, some, some people don't really like to talk much about their own personal spiritual journey. They feel like it's too indulgent in the person, you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to the, the knowledge that they may wish to espouse. But uh, do you, would you mind touching upon that a little bit? Sure. In my case, it just might be too long, too well, many names. Give us the Reader's Digest version, maybe. <laughs> I grew up as an atheist. My family was uh, had no religion as, as many generations back as we know about. Mm -hmm. There was no religion at all in my family. So I grew up sort of a de facto atheist. Mm -hmm. um, and I define atheist as someone who lacks the belief in God. Yeah. So I just didn't know anything about it. And uh, But I was always interested in, in thoughts, feelings, questions about life. But I didn't really know, I didn't really do anything about it until college. And I was, or until like my last year of high school. I was sort of lonely, so I started pursuing psychology. I studied humor as well as a way to sort of feel happier. Mm -hmm. And then I tripped up on the... Uh, on the books of Ayn Rand. Hmm. So I became like uh, an absolutist objectivist. Huh. Are you familiar with her writings? A little bit. Existence um, exists. And she's sort of like an Aristotelian. I think of her more as a uh, commentator on economics. Yeah, than, she's a yeah. uh, financial conservative, um, and she believed in a rational self-interest, hmm. um, limited government, uh, egotism is good, uh, rationality is good, and you love that in other people which is the most uh, characteristic of humankind, which is reason. Mm. So that was pretty good, and I got married to a lady who was also an, uh, an objectivist, <clears throat> and then we got divorced, and I was really depressed. Mm. I was in the army at the time, and basically I thought I was reasonable, she was reasonable, the philosophy was reasonable, but the marriage didn't work, so I threw everything out and started over. Love knows no reason. And then I became a total atheist, uh, irrationalist, um, amoralist, following the writings of Max Stirner, huh. who was probably the most uh, nihilistic philosopher ever to have written. Hmm. Um, he was a precursor to Nietzsche. Ah. And he was actually more extreme than Nietzsche. So that was okay. And then I had, um, I, f I followed that until I actually s felt lonely. I entered graduate school. I felt quite lonely because graduate school life is quite lonely. Mm -hmm. You're not coddled. You're not treated as an adult yet. You don't have enough money to actually live a life. So I actually went to uh, a gospel church with my secretary while I was working in the, in the development office. And I heard this gospel singing got under my skin. Mm. And it, it was healing a really sort of empty, hollow, sore place in me. Mm. And so I sort of felt it, it, something, something very um, mystical happened. Mm. And I felt sort of complete. I didn't feel that hollowness anymore or that lack. And that has never left. And I joined the church and I became a deacon. And this was like the Pentecostal Holy Roller, the most conservative church you can imagine. Wow. That's very interesting. <laughs> and then but during that I didn't feel a um a I didn't feel 
an integration between the life of the intellect and the life of the emotion and spirit. Right. Here I was, I was going to graduate school in philosophy, had nothing to do with my church life. That didn't have anything to do with the philosophy. So I was sort of like wondering, hmm, there was part of me that wanted to let the intellect kind of pursue something. I'm surprised you didn't end up switching to a theological seminary or something, or you know, trying to weave religion into your philosophy. You know, that was an option, but our church was too conservative for that. They didn't uh -huh. really like theological seminary. Too much thinking going on there. So I, I just didn't pursue that route. I knew it was a possibility, but I just didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So then, basically, I moved out of that city, and that was Rochester. I you know, got my degree. I left, came to New York City. Um, instead of joining the, the, the New York City branch of that, of that denomination, I just sort of visited different churches. And one day, I was riding my bicycle in Central Park when I found, uh, I, uh, found this other guy who had the same kind of bicycle I did. So we started talking, and he liked philosophy and all this spiritual stuff, too. So he basically turned me on to the Western mystical tradition, hmm. which was like theosophy, anthroposophy. He was a Rudolf Steiner right. student. Madame Blavatsky and all that. Right. And hmm. so that, since you know, that is kind of like a, uh, a hodgepodge of different ideas from Tibetan Buddhism, from Hinduism, from... Uh, esoteric Christianity from Rosicrucianism that turned me on to that whole area of of inner like endeavor that I'd never known about before did you have any difficulty transitioning from Pentecostal Christianity to that because I mean there's a, little, a, lot of, a lot of guilt little, laid on you there you know in a terms little bit of, yes yeah, I did I going actually, to hell and everything in fact when I found that there were Eastern elements in mm -hmm. in Steiner's you know Blavatsky's uh, thinking, their background, their, the literary sources, I kind of felt a little bit of ooh, like that. Yeah, right. So mystical Christianity was as far as I could go for a while. But then as I, but what mystical Christianity teaches you basically in a, in a, in a word is that the metaphorical and poetical approach to the Bible, say, mm -hmm. should be given more weight than the literal. In mm -hmm. fact, that it's all metaphorical. Right. And so that opens up, that basically uh, opens the gates and it, it frees you from guilt, basically. Mm -hmm. So I started feeling it was more okay. So as that sort of got metabolized into me, I opened up towards more Eastern, more Eastern um, sources, more Eastern kind of thinking, until the point when there was none of that guilt left. It was all, you know, it was all okay. And then um, out of all those, uh, it was formal traditional Advaita Vedanta that interested me the most. Mm -hmm. And so I pursued that, and that sort of, uh, this is before a lot of this stuff was on the internet. This is in the early 90s. Right. So um, there were some good old uh, esoteric bookstores in New York before Barnes & Noble sort of edged everyone out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I found some wonderful old texts and, you know, uh, found some places to go. I joined the Rosicrucians. I joined the Freemasons. I became a 32nd degree Freemason. And, you know, wa wanting spiritual insights and wisdom and you know the secrets of the universe didn't find them there um, but I kept looking and so mm. at this Advaita Vedanta and the uh, the sort of non-dualism that's sort of the the, the essence of that of, of uh, Advaita Vedanta was the one that that grabbed me the most and what I was interested in is what is it that I am mm -hmm. what is it that anyone is what is it that makes a person a person or What's responsible for your identity? That's what I was mostly interested in. Yeah. Were you at this point adopting any practices, or you yes, I was. I was. Okay. I yeah. was. Yes, I was. I was. Um, I had an altar. Mm -hmm. I would light incense to the altar. I was looking for a guru at the time, and I didn't know whether it should be a person or what. Um, so I looked around for different candidates, mm -hmm. and I couldn't really find any that made me feel like the way people report when they find their true human guru. You know, I tried a lot of the candidates and it just didn't strike that right. kind of uh, interest in me. Mm -hmm. So what I what I really glommed onto was the uh, Manduki Upanishad, the book. Yeah, I heard you but, saying that just this morning. I was listening to a recording of you. What, what was it about the Manduki Upanishad that you liked so much? It was so, so deep and so direct and so to the point. Mm -hmm. And it has quite philosophical, which is sort of a 
a language that I could speak and under, I could resonate with. Hmm. So I said, okay, that really goes to it. And Is I that the one that has that, that verse, two birds sit on the self same tree and the one bird partakes of the fruit and the other partakes not? You know that, that verse in the Upanishads? Actually, uh, no, it's not. It's all uh. about, um, it talks about the twirling of the firebrand and the three states of uh, uh, wakefulness, dream, and deep sleep. Mm -hmm. It's very, very philosophical. In fact, it's the only Upanishad, sometimes it's spoken about as the only Upanishad that doesn't require any faith in the Hindu tradition. Mm. And it happened to be the first one that I read, and it really struck home with me. Mm. So that was, I was doing a meditation about those verses. Yeah. And at the same time, I was looking into regular meditation. Mm -hmm. So I went to um, um, several different meditation centers in New York City and learned you know, how to sit. Where I f It's funny, I was looking for a kind of meditation that was most closely aligned to the to the kind of silence and the quietness and the peace that it that it sort of requires for you to do this deep inquiry. Right. And where I found it was Zen. Uh -huh. So for several years I went to a Zendo in Manhattan and that kind of sitting and that kind of activity of the mind, which is like a lack of activity of the mind, was perfect for the kind of quietness and the 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 grasp of the extreme subtleties that it takes to do a deep inquiry. Because hmm. if your mind's jumping all around and you're trying to wrestle with some very subtle uh, point of inquiry, you just can't do it unless you can stay on track. Right. And Zen is a is I found to be a, a very 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 good way, like zazen, a very good way to keep the mind without going. Because you have to always be careful. You don't want to let the mind get carried away by chains of thoughts, and on the other hand, you don't want to let it go to sleep. Right. So that that razor's edge in between the two. If training on that is, I found very very helpful. Yeah, and some of the more sophisticated Vedantic teachings, re you know, they they actually require long trains of thought. I mean, Shankara will go on with a very sort of long, complex, you know, logical sequence yep. of points, and you have to really maintain subtlety to follow it. You do, and you do, and so the better you can uh, keep on a chain, you know, keep on track, mm -hmm. the better you can get into those, you know the more fruitful those change of thought will be. Yeah. And I also went to uh, uh, traditional Advaita Vedanta teaching, too, from mm -hmm. the Chinmaya Mission. They have classes all over, and they study the texts, the formal, traditional ways. Interesting. Well, it's kind of interesting the way you just went from one thing to the next and were w willing to not box yourself in with any particular thing that you encountered, but you know, you take each thing as a stepping stone. and. Yeah, you know, that I, I th think about that sometimes myself, like, why was that possible? Mm -hmm. And I think in my life, what, um, what made that possible was growing up in California being sort of a, a very open, multicultural place, multilingual place. Yeah. That the only kind of, the only time in my life where I ever felt that, that monotonic guilt was in the Christian church. Right. And I didn't go into it thinking. I just kind of acquired that. It's sort of like part of the institutional. It's part of the ethos. package. Yeah. Yeah. And so as soon as I got out of that, you know, it kind of it, it, it burned off. And mm -hmm. I never had it before, and I never had it since. Yeah. Huh. So um, at what point did you encounter um, Sri Atmananda Krishna Menon, or am I getting ahead of the story? Oh, yeah. Well, there's one step before that. Okay. And that is that um, my main inquiry, all the. I was describing the practices, but my I had one question that I was is, was uh, focusing on this whole time. It took years, and that is, what is it that I am? Mm. That I was I was truly, sincerely interested in that. I wasn't interested in it because someone told me that that's what it takes. I didn't have any conception of the end point or at all. I just really was interested in in that question, in knowing, you know, in discovering the answer. I had no idea what the answer would be, or what it would bring or what the effects would be, I was sincerely interested. So I had it narrowed down to, to something, whatever it is that I am has something to do with some very, very subtle part of the mind, if at all. Mm. Like it wasn't any part of the body, it wasn't anything you could see or feel or touch. And I looked into the reincarnational teachings very closely. So Buddhism has theirs, you know, the esoteric Christianity has theirs. Advaita Vedanta has theirs. So I looked into that, and it talked all about the, the different sheaths 
You're familiar with that notion? Sure, koshas. So I looked at the kosha notion very carefully, and I thought it's something in the koshas <coughs> that is not so gross that it is physically visible. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit subtle so that it's the kind of thing that can go from one lifetime to the next, mm -hmm. because that's what, it, that's what accounts for it being your same stream, life stream. So it's something in there. What is it? I wanted to grasp it and hold it and you know, be able to behold what that is that makes me me. Uh, what I'd been doing was describing my practices, but the question that I was most interested in was, what is it that I am? What is it that makes me me or makes any person what they are? Like, where does that identity reside, if anywhere? So I was looking at, you know, I'd, I'd already... I'd already sort of realized in graduate school that there's no such thing as physicality mm -hmm. uh, because I had a the Barclay teacher who drilled that into our heads and I actually grokked that and realized that one day. So I knew it couldn't be possibly in anything physical. So then that leaves, you know, the other what's the other side of that duality? Well, it had to be something mental, some sort of subtle level. So I looked at the most subtle levels that I could find, which would were in the reincarnation teachings, and I found that there were different different sort of bundles and different sort of um, impulses and elements there. And the one that felt the most, the one I got the most charge out of was that part of me that decides, that chooses, that, you know, the, the part that maybe is behind the free will or that chooses one option over another. That's where I felt like, oh, there must be something there. I felt like a, like a little buzz when I thought about that. Mm -hmm. So then, for the next couple of years, I, I investigated that very issue, free will, or choosing. What is it that chooses? What is it, you know, where does it come from? And I examined my entire life. Uh, I found, that I looked at back at the times when I felt choice was most anguished and most difficult. And I also looked at the times of life when choice was almost transparently uh, taking care of itself. Those times felt better, of course, and so it made me think, ah, that's interesting. The parts that feel better are the parts when the choice, the part that I think is me, is not there. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting. I didn't really know how to look into it, though. So I was reading different books, and finally I read um, uh, Ramesh Balsakar's Consciousness Speaks, and to my delight, the, almost the entire book was about that very issue. So basically, uh, I was able to see that that part that chooses is just an arising in awareness, and the, 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 the part that chooses, the choice itself, any feeling you have about choice is just a spontaneous, choiceless, causeless arising in awareness. Mm -hmm. And that hit home really, really deeply, and so the whole notion of identity just vanished. And not just Greg's identity, just, I, just identity as a concept, identity as a possibility, just uh, stopped making sense and it just vanished. One thing I found interesting about you and listening to you know it, um, audios of your talks is the extent to which um, an intellectual understanding of something shifts your experience. I, I don't think that it works to that degree with everybody but like for instance you said that when you overcame the notion of physicality you became a lot more daring and started riding skateboards in New York and bicycles in the street and, with no know, brakes <laughs> yeah with no brakes and stuff that uh, you wouldn't have had the courage to do before when you thought of yourself as merely a physical entity mm -hmm. um, and I suppose I, don't, I just don't know if it you know it's like people well ultimately people have you know concepts about what enlightenment is they read about it they study about it and so on but many people can go decades just entertaining concepts without having the actual experience um, and mm. in your case I don't know about full-blown enlightenment or whatever we can get to that but uh, you know at each step of the way it seems like your your path has been so much a it's an intellectual path I would mm. say then you can disagree with that if you'd like but uh, but it's been very effective for you as each intellectual insight has actually been not merely that, but has also been an experiential insight. It's 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 triggered or catalyzed an experiential shift. Would you say that's a fair assessment? 
Pretty fair. Mm -hmm. Although, is the more you get into it, the more the distinction disappears between one category of experience and another. Yeah. So, like intellectual versus what? What would you say? Well, physical versus emotional versus intuitive. What are those other categories? And what is, without real stuff out there, what can you use to distinguish one from another? Yeah. You know, without well, a brain or a mind, then what can distinguish the intellect from the body of emotions or from the heart? Mm -hmm. You know, what what is it? If you have a heart, if you have a mind, then you can pin those distinctions on them. But if you don't, what is there? Well, when I say intellectual versus experiential, I mean like, you know, for instance, John McPhee wrote a book about oranges. And you could read that book, and then you could become a botanist, and you could study oranges, and you could learn a whole lot about them. But if you actually never ate one, you know, when you finally did, you'd think, whoa, that, mm -hmm. now that's an experience. I mean, all this other stuff was just, you know, concepts. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, a, in most cases in life, there's a, a distinction between the concepts we have about a thing and the actual experience of the thing. If Yeah, and most, uh, that's where it starts to get really shaky when you do non-dual inquiry. That whole model of things uh, gets very shaky. But mm -hmm. if you want to sort of re take a step back into that model, then one of the things that Advaita Vedanta teaches is that there's the, the bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, uh, karma yoga, raja mm -hmm. yoga, and they all have different they all sort of have different entry points, but all of them are such that they can take you all the way. Mm -hmm. So why is, there, why is there that choice? Why are those the possibilities of four different yogas or more? It's because people are different. Right. People have different, they're wired differently. Yeah. And so maybe I'm just wired that way. No, you have a very good point, and I'm glad you mentioned it. And I'm glad you mentioned it in the context of Vedanta, you know, because very often... Um, these other types of yogas or practices or approaches are dismissed as uh, either trivial or, or preliminary or irrelevant or whatever by, mm. by various teachers. You know, they, yeah. uh, they glom onto a particular approach or angle or perspective and feel that that obviates the others or dis you know. Yes, yeah, true. And when I was reading the Bhagavad Gita very seriously, mm -hmm. there are parts of all the yogas in the Bhagavad Gita. Yes. And each one says it's the best. That right. was really confusing to me yeah. until I sort of looked at it in a sort of poetic, ironic way. I said, mm -hmm. ah, yes, of course, because mm -hmm. you, you'll glom onto one. It's, it's ideas to be transformational. So you read all four, and oh, it's chapter three that does it for me, you know? Yeah. And so that's what it is. So that's, uh, so mine, and you know, like I did the Enneagram one time, and I did all these other tests. Mm -hmm. I tend to be like an intellectual type person. That yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah, and the other side of me, the other polarity is very, very, very sentimental emotionality. Hmm. You like old movies or something? <laughs> yeah, I cry at the drop of a hat. You know? Oh, that's that's yeah. sweet. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, speaking of Shankar, we spoke of him before. I mean, for instance, he said, and you were saying before, like you needed to practice Zen to get the quiet mind that would enable you to kind of do this this inquiry. He he said, for instance, that. Um, you know, not everyone is suited for Gyana Yoga, and you might actually need to do Karma Yoga or do, you know, Seva of some kind mm -hmm. or ver various mm -hmm. things to sort of purify yourself to the point where you had the clarity to do Gyana Yoga. And of course, a lot of people don't like that progressive uh, whole way of talking that you, you yeah. know, progress through stages of purity and eventually arrive at worthiness or, or capability to do some other thing and so on. But yeah, a lot of people don't like that. It's true. No, it's it's like it's well, you um, know what? It, uncool in, in non dual circles. It is. It is quite <laughs> uncool. Um, Advaita Vedanta again has a really nice way to think about that, and that mm -hmm. is that um, think about the those different yogas are at different layers of subtlety. So. Yeah. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so the lower levels sort of have the power to shake up the more subtle levels. So, for example, if your body is uncontrollable, then your emotionality will be uncontrollable. Right. If your emotionality is uncontrollable, then your ability to focus your mind is uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. If your ability to, unfocus your, to focus your mind is uncontrollable, you can't do the subtle inquiry. Right. So you do the karma yoga. It, puts, it makes the body in sort of the lower levels of emotionality smooth. Mm -hmm. I did that in the army, where you're, you know, karma yoga is doing something where the, act, the results of the actions are not for your own benefit, but for that of someone else or you know, God or your guru. Yeah. So the army was my guru. <laughs> so the army got all the benefit of my actions. Mm. And then the, you know, the, 
the bhakti yoga was for me Christianity mm -hmm. the raja yoga was all the meditation and Zen and so that clears the path for jnana yoga which is that self-inquiry stuff and if you're in a typical traditional Hindu s uh, setting then you'll have the opportunity to do all those you know a nice rich uh, mix of all those yogas and you'll find the balance that it requires for you but yeah. in New York, New York City you know working a day job you can't do that right and I w might add that probably the sequence and the emphasis might be different for different people they're not necessarily going to go in the same sequence that you you know engaged in them they could be oh. you know bhakti could come after such and such but um and also the degree of indul of immersion in one or the other is going to be different like you you were just saying yours has been primarily a jnana yoga or knowledge mm -hmm. immersion because that's the way you're wired yeah yeah you know um there has to be a little but each one of those has to have a part none of them can be totally missing yeah but the balances are different for different people right which is beautiful if you think about it. I mean, we're all just sort of expressions of that one essence, and, and it would be a little kind of a, not like the way God operates to make us all identical in our makeup spiritually yeah. any more than we are in, uh, you know, our appearance or yeah. any, anything else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look at that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so have we gotten to the Atmananda Krishna Menon step yet? Hmm. That was next. Oh, good. So here it is. No identity. Mm -hmm. That would put... And you really feel like there, at that stage, sense of personal identity had evaporated. Evaporated, yeah. There's no, no, there's no more suffering. Mm -hmm. There's no more basis of suffering. What is it that could suffer? Because everything that you could point to or name is mm -hmm. nothing but an arising in this, in this uh, awareness. So there's nothing, there's nothing that is... Nothing stays. Actually, and that didn't um, hamper your your effectiveness or your, your not func functionality or anything like that. You, no, because that's you, you didn't have to go sit on a park bench for a couple of years to adjust to it or some some such thing. No, because I'd been thinking about these things for a long time, mm -hmm. and it wasn't a surprise. It was very gentle. Yeah, it's just like ah, aha. I mean, the the moment was you know big and it had like you know fireworks and stuff. But after that, um, it was ah. Mm. Yeah, like that. Um, and I had a day job, and I had already been integrating these spiritual activities with my uh, professional activities, you know, my day, uh, my day-to-day -day life. I'd been riding my bicycles and stuff like that. So everything was sort of integrated and rolling along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, but so, Atmananda's teaching has a a name for that place I was. Of course, in in Ramesh's teachings, there was. That would be it. Right. But there was something that I was not satisfied with. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of suffering. It was a matter of sort of sweet, beckoning curiosity. And that was, okay, there's no identity. There's no phenomenality. Everything, if there is anything, is an arising in awareness. And it not, doesn't stay, doesn't go. But there seemed like this very distinction between arising and awareness itself. Like, what is that? Mm. That doesn't seem like it's non-dual. So in other words, on, on the more, just to make sure I understand what you just said, um, on the more sort of abstract, absolute, fundamental level, there's awareness, but then apparently, mysteriously, uh, something, things were arising out of yeah. awareness. And I didn't think, I, yeah, and that, as far as what it was that was rising out of awareness, I didn't think of things like, trees and cars and stuff like that. That's not how it seemed, how to experience. It was experienced as, actually they ha could have no name really, you know, maybe a color, a sound, a feeling, but there was nothing very serious that distinguished them. Like I was saying before, between the intellect and the emotions, mm -hmm. um, you can't really pin that distinction on anything. But you could certainly distinguish a tree from a car. You'd be dangerous if you couldn't. Well, I wouldn't say that's what I was doing. I could say that there was a manner of speaking according to which you could say that, but I wouldn't say that that was the truth of my experience. The truth uh -huh. of my experience was flow. Yeah. But on some more manifest practical level, you were still able to drive cars and not run into trees. And well, I didn't have, yeah, I didn't have accidents, you know. Yeah. If anything, uh, all those, the, the, functional, the functional things were actually improved. 
everything yeah. improved. Mm -hmm. My getting along with other people improved. Um, riding my bike, as we mentioned before, because it had no brakes. It has no gears and no brakes. It's New York City. I don't understand why you don't have brakes, but maybe that's a side issue. I just rode my bike to get a haircut eight miles and back, and and uh, use the brakes. Well, look, I at the definitely fixed, use the uh, brakes. Track bikes, fixed gear track bikes. It's a big deal nowadays. Um, and people ride them on city streets. Yeah, that's where this back issue best because there's no hills, and you can huh. you can control your your speed. You can control your uh, your cornering and maneuvering really, really, really minutely. And if a tra and if a taxi comes cutting in front of you, what happens? You just turn. Okay. <laughs> you don't stop. You turn. You you find a hole and you go through it. Okay. Good. Yeah. Onward, ever onward. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's videos. On, I have a website called OldSchoolTrack.com, and there's videos of how to do that and stuff. Well, like maybe that. we'll link to that just to <laughs> satisfy people's curiosity, because I was curious. <laughs> um, so there was something that <clears throat> was still. It felt like a feeling of honey calling me. Like what? It, this feel a sweet kind of calling, and that was what is it that there seems to be like a distinction here between the subjectivity and this whatever it is that is arising. Hmm. It's not. It hasn't settled all into just non-duality, whatever that would be. And for many teachings, there's nothing to say about that. It's just that's just the way it is. That's yeah. just that's your end point. But I, I, it seemed like it was still dualistic and maybe because I was looking at it it's, it's kind of an abstract way to think about it because I wasn't worried about cars or death or anything like that it was just this very 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 subtle distinction between here and that which arises to here mm. was the distinction was the curiosity or the, f the fascination more with uh, a, a, a curiosity about what it is that actually um causes the arising? No. Like wh no. What is the intelligence behind this? No. Or, or was it more like a feeling like, hey, the, if, if everything is ultimately non-dual, how come I'm seeing yeah, it was two, kind of two like components a, here? Yeah, it was more like that. There was okay. uh, Causality had totally dropped out of the picture hmm. because you can't have something causing something unless the thing exists. Yeah. Right? Because let's say they have one thought. Let's say, look, look at these in terms of thoughts. One thought can't cause another thought because they don't even touch each other. There's, mm. no, there's no contact between two thoughts, so that how can they cause each other? So if I didn't, I already didn't have objects, like physical objects, mm -hmm. so and I already didn't have a notion of um, functionality like the emotions can cause the thoughts, mm -hmm. that had all um, dissolved into these beneficent arisings in awareness. So ah. causality had no room to grab hold. So yeah, I wasn't totally was not interested in you know causality just wasn't an issue. But it was it did seem like a little bit of a discrepancy. It's almost like a a challenge. Like it seems like there's a little bit of a tuness here. Yeah. Um, it's okay. It's sweet. They, I could you know it's nothing wrong with it at all. Um, it's just not like non-duality. So I looked into that for another several years. That was my question for another several years. And it was, um, you know, Atma Darshan that I was reading a paragraph of Atma Darshan, and that became clear. Atma Darshan is a book yeah, from Atman. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's one of his books. Atmananda, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It has to do with time and memory and this and that, and mm. um, it just the notion of there being an arising can't really <clears throat> make sense unless there's a past and a future and an other than this. Yeah. So there's no way within the, let's say within the perspective of one arising, mm -hmm. um, there cannot, there's no evidence, there's no direct experience of any arising other than this, thisness right now, right here. In other words, what you and I are experiencing right now, what my arising, your arising, were, is that what you're saying? Like, no evidence of anything outside our little offices that we're sitting in. No, what it, our offices themselves are arising. So I'm talking about, um, right. give a very abstract name to thought, let's say a thought, mm -hmm. let's say the current thought. Okay. Let's say you don't even think it's a thought, it's just like something that is appearing now. Mm -hmm. So from the perspective of that appearance, there is no other appearance. That, um, for there to be evidence of another appearance from the perspective of this appearance, 
there would have to actually that appearance would have to be there but it's it's already gone if there was another appearance in the past it's already gone it is not here to answer for itself it's right. not here to make itself evident so if I could use a concrete example um, an hour ago I was riding my bicycle so from the pers but now I'm sitting talking to you and so from the perspective of this appearance there's no evidence of that appearance that hap that right. let's say the talking appearance mm -hmm. there's no evidence of the bicycle appearance in the talking appearance and even right. if there's a memory let's say that there's a memory of, uh, like a present appearance of a memory of a bicycle appearance mm -hmm. there's the me say okay well there's the memory of the bicycle appearance but where is the bicycle outside that memory where is the bicycle appearance itself Right. There might be some lingering effects too. I mean, maybe I'm tired, or maybe my legs hurt, or you know, something. Okay. Like so that. let's say that let's say that's from the perspective of from the perspective of the uh, like the leg hurting, like a burning soreness mm -hmm. of muscle soreness. Yeah. They don't, but I'm just as a case in point. I'm just bringing. Yeah. Up. Let's whatever evidence you'd like to bring about. Let's mm -hmm. say that you skinned your elbow. You know. Yeah. Looking right. at there's a there's a fell off a bike elbow. or something. Outside of that appearance there's no other appearance at all some people who are kind of like realist oriented when they hear something like that they call it the solipsism of the present moment mm -hmm. um, I don't look at it like that because already by this time solipsism is impossible you know solipsism is that notion that I am the only consciousness there is or I'm the only mind there is mm -hmm. but already this uh, we're past the level of the mind already. We're past the level of an individuated consciousness hmm. because there's no borders. There's nothing to distinguish one consciousness from another. Like consciousness can never be plural right. in this. So, but if you look at this arising, whatever it is, how, you know, however you want to describe it, there's, it has access. It doesn't have access to anything else. And even if it seems to, it's just an appearance of access. It's not true mm -hmm. access. So what that led me to was, <clears throat> if there can't be two, then there can't be one. So the notion of arising itself just evaporated hmm. altogether. And so that duality evaporated as well. And huh. it's never come back. If there can't be two, there can't be one. Um, I'm trying to think of a way of making this a little bit more concrete. <laughs> it's not concrete, I know. No, it's not. That's the problem. But, you know, I'm thinking of people who are listening to this and scratching their heads, and, and I'm, doing, I'm scratching my head a little bit, and I'm trying to think, oh, well, you know, how can we make this really clear to people? Can you think of anything that there is only one of? Uh, the only thing I could think of is if we, you know, think of oneness itself or, or consciousness or, you know, totality or Brahman, if you want to use that word, that you know, contains everything within it, uh, and it gets, uh, all, nothing other than that actually that's ultimately level, exists. That's level I was talking about, but can you think of anything else? No. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> so the, yeah. the elseness disappeared. Yeah, I mean, I can think of things that there are many of, if we yeah. want to put it that way. Many, that, there are many cups and there are many cats, and that's exactly my point. For there to be anything phenomenal at all, there has to be the ability to have more than one of them. Yeah. Okay. And if there is not that ability, if it's impossible for there to be more than one of X, mm -hmm. then you can't even really have X. And so that goes for anything phenomenal. And so then, um, you know, oneness becomes sort of uh, a wonderful poetic kind of thing. It's not a, it's not a, it doesn't become another thing like a Coke bottle, mm -hmm. you know. So say you that again that you just said a minute ago. You said for there to be, say, it, say, uh, say that, you know that sentence. For there to be anything at all, like okay. a tree or you, you showed me your coffee cup, mm -hmm. there has to be the ability to have more than one of them. Right. Because it has to be s something of a type. Like yes. This is one example of a cup. And so you're not saying there aren't mm, millions of cups in the world. The, this not saying, no, I'm I, I have a cup because there are also other cups. Right. And yeah. so I have an arising because there are also other arisings. Right. But. Let's say there aren't other arisings. Then I can't even have this one. Right. That's and are I'm you saying that, in, uh, that ultimately there aren't? Right. That's what happened. That yeah. I found out that there couldn't be more than one arising, like this, this, mm -hmm. this, this, all the time. Uh -huh. um, there can't be other than this. So th this can't be one of a series of arisings. 
It can't because you'd have to have a plurality of that. Right. <coughs> like Nate, think of a risings like cups. Mm -hmm. We already agreed that if you can't have many cups, you can't even have one cup. The notion of cup wouldn't even make sense. Right. That happened with the risings. So that. So is there any arising at all, or are you saying there is, but there's only one arising? No, I'm saying that there isn't at all. So there's no arising. Right. Okay, and I'm not so that is a metaphysical matter of fact. I'm saying I'm talking about my progress of my inquiry. Yes, and also um, your your experience. Yeah, I my mean, experience of multiplicity of, of right. seriality. You know, like this happened, then this arising came, then this arising came, then this arising came, just evaporated. Mm -hmm. And yet you live a very dynamic, demanding life. You you work in New York City. You know, you work with computers. You you navigate traffic on a bicycle with no brakes. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, so obviously you're you know you're not sitting in a cave with your eyes closed. You're, right. you're, doing, you're doing really dynamic stuff. And yet you're saying that in the midst of all that, there's no arising. Right. I wouldn't say that it's certainly and definitely and truly the case that I'm doing all the things that you mentioned. Right, yes. Or that you're oh. doing them either. Because if you are doing them, then, they're, they're, then there's an arising. There's let things, it, yeah, let things it, being done. Yeah, let it be a manner of speaking that we're speaking about. You know? Yes, so th good. I'm not against the way of speaking. Yeah. Like I didn't start talking funny. Or mm -hmm. acting funny, right? You know, uh, um, I continue to ride. I ride a different kind of bicycle now, which is called a recumbent. Which yes, I've seen those. Yeah, where you lean back and your legs are forward and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, they're cool. So you better have a big flag on it so pe trucks don't run you over. Or something. <laughs> it's like something to think about, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's interesting. So I'm just kind of, you know, I mean, I used nitty gritty examples of what you apparently do in your apparent life. Um, and you're saying that this this understanding experience thing is so grounded that in the midst of what others would perceive as a very diverse and dynamic existence um, for you if I can say for you I realize that has its problems but there is there is really just no rising and so if there's no rising then what is there? Just um, s pure silence everywhere, oneness, uh, an oceanic sort of state with little yeah. apparent ripples on the surface? So Not even. The, the notion of, you ask what is there, the, mm -hmm. that whole notion just evaporated. Huh. Like for a, a, a little while after that happened, I lost my ability to talk about this. Cause but no not about but not about mundane things, just about this. Yeah, it made no more sense. And then I, then I realized, like the notion of Talking about an arising or you, you mentioned you. Like for mm -hmm. some, for some teachings or people, perhaps the word you or I is charged. Oh, you have to really dance around that word yeah. when you're talking to some people. You know. Well, <laughs> for me, all words are like that. Yeah. I mean, all nouns, they all terminate in consciousness anyway. I mean, where mm -hmm. do they point? Well, there's nothing. What is there to point to? Yeah. When a word, when a word starts up, it arises from consciousness. When the word stops, like stops. Where does it point? It points right to consciousness. It goes right to mm -hmm. consciousness in that model. So all words are as uh, free or as problematic as the word you or I. Mm. That's maybe why I didn't talk, start talking funny, that I didn't adopt a special language because it didn't seem – for a while I was kind of mm, – but it didn't seem like there was any privileged way to talk about this, that any yeah. way was any other. I think the reason people who talk that way talk that way is they're trying to convey – uh, the nature of their state or their experience and and they they don't want to mislead people into thinking that there really is someone in here you know some isolated entity who is talking and right. so they they kind of dance around and use you know this one or i don't know yeah. i can't i but can't do it myself but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well uh, this body why is or that, why is that any from here it is seen that such right. and such you know yeah but I think that's kind of an incompleteness because why would other words be unproblematic but that would be problematic? Yeah. Like why is it not across the board? I, I think I agree. I mean, some teachings kind of target one particular issue and if, you're, if you've come up through a teaching that targeted the I or the self or the, those personal pronouns, uh -huh. then you might not then you might want to dance around those but not feel you should dance around the other stuff. But mm. I'd either always dance or, like, not dance. Yeah. 
I think it's cool that you've actually gone through so many teachings because it's given you an adaptability, it seems to me, um, a, a, you know, an, an ability to kind of um, to accommodate any level of people's experience, wherever it may be, yeah. without having to kind of play word games with them. And um, you know. yeah, I yeah yeah. Um, I remember when non-duality first hit the internet mm -hmm. in the like mid to late 90s is when it was really hot. People were discovering this uh, non-dual ways of speaking. Yeah, and the whole gang was coming back from uh, you know Lucknow and so on. Right, <clears throat> and then there were their students. Um, you know, maybe people younger than them were mm -hmm. like discovering the internet, and they were getting on there and you know talking and taking the teacher position with each other. Right, right. You know? yeah. who's asking? Well, who's asking? Who's asking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then that we just found a lot of um, you know the I wrote an article about the Lucknow disease. Oh, um, I, I might have read that article at some point. I'd like to read it again, actually. Yeah, yeah there's something on Sarlo's uh, website. Yeah, about uh, satsang hijinks. Right. You know some of the some of the dramatic issues that come up during those things. You know, mm -hmm. but that that kind of that, that was a that was a thing for its time. You know, kind of. Melted yeah. way in the early 2000s. Yeah, there's still some remnants of that around, actually. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I, I kind of run into it interviewing all these people, and, and and then people getting on my site and leaving comments and having discussions with each other. I mean, there's there's still kind of flavor of that. Yeah, and you know, I I noticed something. I noticed something about the. I'm interested in rhetorical studies, and I'm, I'm, I see something about the rhetoric of these comments, and that is that, it's all people. Adopting the role of teacher versus the other, like I'm telling you something, mm -hmm. and I sometimes think of that as being a product of their own experience, because their own, the teachings that they have um, consumed, mm -hmm. have been these oracular little you know pointers. Maybe they've spent years with I am that. Mm. So if you look at, so what has a person done? They've you know for five years they've read little bits to tell you what to do and what to do and how to see things and where to go and what to ignore and stuff like that. So when you go to start talking to others, because there's almost very compulsive um, urge to start sharing this when you know something like sure it's human it. nature. We share, we see a good movie, we want to tell our friends about it. Whatever. Yeah. And so so someone does this here, and how have they learned to speak? Mm -hmm. Well, they've learned to speak by what they've read and what they've read is do this do that don't do this do this see this and so that's how they speak vis-a-vis -vis other people so how uh, do you feel that or why um, that in your case the the path you pursued studying what you studied and doing what you did uh, was fruitful in terms of um, you know bringing about uh, uh, terminology is clunky here bear with me bringing about a, a kind of a non-dual realization that um, made that enabled you to sort of continue functioning in a very normal uh way where you know a person wouldn't even detect it unless they actually got into this kind of conversation with you whereas the kind of people you were just alluding to on these discussion groups and who uh, never seemed to make that kind of progress they they seemed to have gotten stuck in terminology and and entertaining themselves and squabbling over who's more non-dual than whom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah um that's a very interesting question. I think part of it is my <coughs> pluralistic background and my openness to these different approaches and teachings, and that I snuck up to non-duality. Hmm. Um, I went through these different um, different teachings and different layers and levels pretty much on my own, and I didn't kick any of them in the pants when I changed to something else. You know, I remained friends with them. Yeah. You know, I I, um, I saw them as is just alternate routes and there's something else too that I did this at a time before it was on the internet so much and so mm -hmm. I didn't have people to compare myself to mm. so I never it never dawned on me to compare like to think of myself as having a state and to have that state compared with someone else's state um, it never it never uh, dawned on me to think about things like that did you have any friends or many friends during this whole path yeah, that I you could it. sit around and chat with and hash this stuff out? Um, my friend, my bicycle friend, the, the Western mystic, mm -hmm. the, the Steiner fan, um, he and I lost contact after about a decade. And then the people I used to go to satsangs with, I went to satsangs after like the Ramesh 
the Ramesh incident because I wanted to talk about this stuff. Like you said, I wanted yeah. to share and talk, and and I did meet a lot of people, but the conversations were always one way. That was always them telling me about their experiences. No one ever asked me about mine. So when you went to satsangs, you meant like you know well-known advaita teachers or non-dual teachers who would come to the city, and you'd yeah. you'd go you'd go and sit. I, I met in scores there. of them. Yeah. Yeah, probably all the ones, all the well-known names. Yeah. 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 And the people, you know, so we we had uh, the attendees would be friends with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we actually helped um, host and sponsor many of the teachers as well. Mm. And so, um, the, yeah, the converse, yeah, I've met, and I'm friends today with many of those people still. Sure. Yeah. Did you ever uh, get tempted to do satsangs yourself? Um, no, I don't, for a couple of reasons. I don't know if the format is, <coughs> is, I don't know if it's that effective, actually. Um, Why? Because so much of the focus of the satsang is being like the teacher hmm. or wanting to be close to the teacher. Um, Do you think that the better teachers dis dissuade that kind of um, attitude? Discourage it? Um, I think they do something in addition to that. Uh -huh. You know, I think they, the, the private teachings are good. Yeah, because you can really narrow down what you know what's going on with a particular person, mm -hmm. but just open questions and you know um, the amount of transfer of of benefit from one person's question to another person's answer might not yeah be effective for a particular person if that's all that's done. If there's stuff in addition to that, I think it could be wonderfully effective. And another thing is, I don't have that much time. I'm still working my day job. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Of course, some teachers say that you know the main thing is not so much what they say, but the energetic transmission that takes place, you know, in that setting. That mm -hmm. Somehow, it c it's contagious. Yeah, they do say that. Mm -hmm. And if that were really, if that were transmittable, <coughs> the way that, um, like, HIV is, or something, <laughs> then the then South songs would really be wild scenes. Then we don't have it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Whatever it is, it would it would not be so difficult. Hmm. I think there is something to that, though. There is. It may not be as, um, you know, it might be some people get it, some people don't, and there are degrees to which people get it and so on, but I think there is something about sitting in an atmosphere that's saturated with a certain kind of energy. A certain yeah, kind of energy. It can, it can kind of attune you to that same energy, sure. and, and for okay. some people that can actually be a major transition thing. It can. Um, the energy is sort of like any kind of charismatics at all, you know? Mm -hmm. That's yeah, right. like when you, when you went to that church and heard the the gospel singing, and it yeah. it, it it shifted you in a ir irreversibly. Yeah, in a, cer in a certain certain like, way. Like one particular um, guitar string, the strings all around it are vibrating a certain way, and that will start yeah. to vibrate in the same way. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But then when the strings stop vibrating, they stop yeah. vibrating. So if it's a matter of vibratonics or something like that, this has to go. It has to be something little in addition to that. It can't be. Yeah. It can't be the whole thing. No, but it, you know, metaphors break down. But perhaps with human beings, something is retained, uh, or maybe not always. But you know, or, or perhaps as you're just saying, if supplemented by other things that that are also necessary, it yeah. it can be one um, engine on the train that will, you know, help to bring about realization. Yeah. Because that that's uh, that's very important to the bhakti yoga path. Yes, yes. That's the, you know the the being in the presence of is very important in that particular. Sure. And some so people are are put together such that that's their mm -hmm. that's their resonance. Yeah. You know they could read. And I I have a friend who spent ten years with I am that. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't follow teachers too much. Just reading it over and over. Yeah, and it really 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 helped. Other yeah. people, um, it's just so much lettuce leaves. You know. Yeah. It's just so much word salad, and it just you know they need to f feel something. In the heart, they need to see a, a human presence in front of them that they can mm -hmm. identify with and be close to. Yeah, and that's very. And without that, it just nothing will start moving. Right. So people naturally gravitate to what they need. Ultimately, I think, you know. And if they don't, then they'll gravitate towards something, something else. Something else, and so, and so something will hook. Yeah. So something will kind of like hook on it. Ah, and they'll feel it and they'll go forward in that direction. Right. Yeah. Now, speaking of the heart, you said a little while ago that you know. You're still a, a softy. I mean, you, you, you watch some movie or something, or I don't know what, but it's things that could easily make you cry. Mm -hmm. um, what's going on there in terms of, you know, there being no arising and it's all one and nothing ever happened, and yet uh, there's an inner, kind of a uh, 
I hate to use the word abnormal because there's nothing wrong with it, but you know, it's a sensitivity or an emotionality that is a little bit uncommon, maybe. Yeah. Um, I guess there's two questions. What is it like? What is uh, like how to talk about this? Well, we're uh -huh. talk It's. I don't think talking about this is any different from talking about day jobs or bicycles. Mm -hmm. It's not a special kind of category of stuff, you know. It's just part of the way that what, the way Greg ticks. Just the way you, yeah. The it's, way you're yeah, I have a, again. you know, like a, a sort of well-developed feminine side. As much as I look like a tough guy, you know, like, <laughs> you know, there's a there's a feminine integration with me hmm. there too. You know, um, has always been, or something yeah. that that evolved over time. It's always been. Oh, okay. it's always been. Like many of my best friends have been women uh -huh. through my life, and I've always liked talking about thoughts and feelings. Which I remember when I was growing up. Oh, guys, don't talk about that stuff. You know, right. And huh. but I could talk about that stuff with like my sister and mm -hmm. you know female friends and stuff. Did you ever remarry? Did you what? said you got you said you got divorced at a certain point a long time ago. Uh, oh yeah, I was married. Yeah, ten years ago I married. Yeah, you married again. So you're still married. I'm married now to the oh, okay. one I got married to se ten years ago, and we're very happy. Great, great. And I had an article about um, she came from China, and she was in the immigration process. You know, after we got married, <coughs> she mm -hmm. got put to, uh, in jail. Whoa. Um, two times for a month each. Because they thought she had violated some immigration yeah, law or yeah, something? Yeah, even though we were married. Huh. So, um, you know, I had to, it takes a lot to get a person out of immigration jail. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know sometimes where they are because they move you around. I know there was a great movie. I forget the name of it, but it was set in New York and somebody went to the immigration jail. And, uh, oh, yeah. That's the one um, where the guy learned to play drums. He learned to play conga. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like yeah. it very much. He was this uptight guy living up in Westchester or something. He had an apartment down in the city, and he came down, and he found some people were in it, you know, and he, he ended up making friends with them. Anyway. Yeah, he was, was a, uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he was a longtime character actor for whom that's his first starring role. It was I know, and I think he was actually nominated for an Oscar for that yeah, I role. Think he was, yeah, Or he might have even won it, but at least he was nominated. And anyway, uh, <laughs> and we're, we're together, we're happy. And I wrote an article about Kuan Yin. She had prayed to Kuan Yin mm -hmm. um, every day. And they lit, you know, they lit, uh, she didn't have incense to light, so they, they um, rolled up toilet paper tubes, cardboard mm -hmm. toilet taper, taper tubes, and um, had, had that as their incense. And uh, she did lots of chants and pray, praying and stuff like that. And I wrote an article on the internet saying, Kuan Yin helps my wife get out of jail. Wow. And people said, wait, you're non-dual. How can you believe in Kuan Yin? <laughs> that's not very non-dual. Uh -huh. Like, it's okay to talk about my wife. That's not non-dual. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not a violation. But Kuan Yin, um, have you noticed that there's often a uh, kind of a materialist bias in non-duality? Very much so. And I actually often try to counter it by things I ask and say during these interviews because, you know, I feel that, um, you know, life in all of its mystery and richness and has many strata and if we want to acknowledge that there is a wife or there is a cup or there is a bicycle then who knows what other wonderful things there might be many of which we might not even be able to perceive for all I know there yeah. really is a Kuan Yin whatever that may be exactly yeah and and the existence of that doesn't in any way conflict with uh, the non-duality of, of life in its ultimate you know value. yeah that's a wonderful kind of openness and especially if it's if the basis of this I mean this kind of non duality that we're talking about is is like has a basis in awareness. Mm -hmm. And there's other kinds of non duality, but that's this one. And so for a person who thinks that everything is awareness, why are cups more permissible than bodhisattvas and angels? Yeah, yeah. I mean the angels are less they're more subtle than cups, so why are cups okay, you know? <laughs> Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, if you if you respect, uh, if people respect sort of traditional teachers and so on, most of the ones you can think of um, had a very devotional side to them and, and kept it. and kept it, or it perhaps even became more pronounced after yeah. their you know realization. Well, that that actually uh, ties into another question you asked mm -hmm. about my um, sentimental side. Yeah, um, my company sent me to to Tokyo for for work for about mm -hmm. uh, three four weeks one time. And so I went to one of the places I toured to was Kamakura, which is a, the heart of medieval Buddhism in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so I saw the Kamakura Buddha, the 34-foot uh, statue of you know, mm -hmm. Copper Buddha. And for the first time in my life, I broke 
down and started crying in front of a spiritual icon. Mm. All the time in Christianity, it never got me just like that. You know, I had respect and the kind of softness in my heart, but it never like made me break down and start crying. Mm. That's beautiful. And it was uh, I sort of adopted that as my devotional idol and image after that. Mm. To this day, you know, and we have uh, we play chants at home. Uh, it's called Pure Land Buddha. Mm-hmm. Buddhism, so that there's a, a Pure Land chant that you can get these uh, Chinese and China and Taiwan, they make these little um, audio boxes that are about that big, like a cigarette pack. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, you, you turn it on, you can adjust the volume, and you can, it could be ACDC, and it plays the Pure Land chant, like the, the saying the, Bodhis, the Buddha's name over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I've had it playing for 10 years. In your house? Yeah. It never stops day and night. And even when we moved, you know, when we moved, we huh. took one in the car with us. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's Interesting. all. Interesting. Yeah. And that's the that's the for that's the sort of the focus of my love and devotion. I was never able to find that before. Remember, I was telling you the best I came up with was a book. Yeah. Because nothing else struck me. Well, hmm. that struck me. It's interesting. So, Ramana Maharshi had his mountain. It was his object of devotion. And I, I, I heard that Nisargadatta used to do, you know, pujas and, and stuff um, often after the, after the crowds would leave. Was yeah. it to his teacher, was I it? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm kind of interested in the whole phenomenon of devotion, um, which, as you say, you know, you actually have gotten flack for because it seems so non-dual, uh, so it seems so dualistic, Yeah. you know. And um, perhaps you could elaborate just a little bit more on what you feel is the significance <coughs> of devotion even after a complete non-dual realization. Does it add sort of icing on the cake? Is it does it sort of add sumptuousness or more? Um, well, it does. It does bliss all that. or it, whatever. It, it does all that. It's not something that you. Um, it's something that sort of comes automatically. Yeah. It's you didn't not, calculate yeah, it or think this is what I, I need. Don't need like more happiness or anything like that. Right. It's not something I do for the joy. It's it's sort of a um, the heart wants to pour out, mm-hmm. and it's sort of I you could think of it as a poetic metaphor for that which is, so that it was one single focus for all of consciousness's energy, mm-hmm. um, so that the emotion sort of gets to highly highly focus itself in one direction. Mm-hmm. And that would be towards that object, kind of like a laser light as opposed to diffuse, uh, yeah, incoherent light. Yeah, and that's just one of many, many, many different ways of speaking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't say that any of the any of them is uh, an accurate description of what happens. Yeah, but it's it's something that makes some sense. That um, there's a you know there's the mind, there's a heart. You know, back in the language world of language, and the heart has its direction to pour out as well. Mm-hmm. The mind can appreciate all this stuff. The heart can uh, feel a very openness when it, when it encounters or approaches the symbol of all that is. And that's the symbol. For me, that's the symbol. Mm. You know? but it, would, do you have one yourself? A symbol? Uh, like a symbol or a devotional object that does, it, that does that same thing for you? Not really. I mean, I... Um I had, uh, you know, I was with Marshi Mahesh Yogi for many years, and I felt a, a good deal of devotion for him. And eventually, I, I left that movement. And these days, I go to see Ama, the Hugging Saint. I've mm-hmm. been doing that for about ten years with my wife, and I have a little little picture of her right here on my desk. Oh, cool. Um, and but I don't feel like I'm a, a highly highly devotional person for some reason. Even even though, although there have been times when that was very consuming, but it was, you know, when it, in the times when it was. Uh, there was there was a sort of a dependency or a yearning or an emptiness or a sort of a oh god you a know, grasping like, kind of a grasping kind of thing. Now I feel complete and content, and for some reason um, a great degree of emotion or devotional quality hasn't arisen out of that. Maybe it will at some point, uh-huh. but but I, maybe that's why I find the the topic fascinating. Maybe I'm a little flat emotionally actually. Mine was the opposite. Yeah, mine when I felt like empty and grasping back when uh, Christianity when I encountered Christianity uh-huh. um, the whole thing is what helped healed me it wasn't like Jesus or God right. it was the church the, the kindness of people 
Right, the whole congregation, everything. Every yeah. it's very nurturing, very, very, very nurturing. Yeah. Um, and so the whole thing was wonderful and kind, and you know the music itself it takes you to a spiritual place. Mm -hmm. um, well, one time we saw the Holy Ghost. We actually saw visually the Holy Ghost. You know? Well, uh, the natural question here is, what did that look? What did it look like? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a gray mist, and it was inside the con It was inside the sanctuary, a gray. And it, it's you know, and the Bible speaks of it as a mighty mist. You said we saw it. Who who else, did other people see it too? Yeah, everybody in the congregation, more or less. Well, the, the folks that were sitting around, you know, the area that I was sitting. Yeah, in, yeah, we all saw it. Yeah, it's like a, a like a cloud descending through the roof. Wow, it's like assembling in the air. When, <laughs> and the spirit of the of the service was very high. Like, hmm. you know, you could look at it if you if you only saw the emotion part. Then you could say, "Oh, there's emotionally that people were like dancing in the aisles. They were mm. speaking in tongues and stuff like that. The music was, you know, really nice, and people looked like really excited. Mm -hmm. But on the spiritual level, there was a lot. You know, it had its level of description as well. And one mm. of the things was that Holy Ghost came as mm. a rushing mighty wind. So interesting. And at this, point, at this point, half the people listening have said, okay, hey, Greg, he's, sign he's, off good, here. he's a nutcase. <laughs> on to the next one. <laughs> um, back to the abstract consciousness. But um, I remember talking <laughs> on one of those uh, forums a while ago, describing that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I'm, I'm talking the language that Christianity talks to describe about. Yeah. Why, why not? Why in the sure. world not? Someone said, oh, mm, what really happened was mm -hmm. a Kundalini arising. Huh. That's the true description of that event. Hmm. Now, what in the world sense does that make? How well, can one of know. those, you know, language which is actually outside the experience itself, be a truer description of the experience than the one that was integrally related with the experience? Sounds like that person was just trying to couch it in his own uh, yeah. conceptual box, it, you know, his own terminology. His box was reality. Yeah. 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 Huh. Well, I mean. That uh, you know, I mean, everything we've been saying recent in in recent minutes in this interview points to the fact that in my father's house there are many mansions. You know, I mean, the the whole field of spirituality is is diverse, and um, there are so many facets that um, pertain to so many people. I mean, there are seven billion of us in this world, and and it's never going to be that everybody sort of latches on to one particular angle, <clears throat> you know, so it's they're just, uh, and who knows, I mean, we're just talking about this world. I, I, I even like to think about how many worlds might be out there and how many forms, you know, of expression of spiritual life th there yeah. might be that we don't e haven't even seen here. Of course, if there, if, if there can't be more than one, there can't be one, so. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Huh. Well, this is fascinating. Do you want to say more about um, Atmananda Krishnamanan? You haven't said much about him. Uh, there's a whole nice I interview you did with um, Chris he Hebert about this, which I have here. But um, it, would it be germane to this discussion, or do you feel like that would we've sort of covered those points? Um, I presume you're kind of. I, I, when I watched this, I thought, well, that's his focus, you know. But now we've gone over all kinds of things that I wouldn't have anticipated. Oh yeah, I you know like. I'm kind of like Groucho Marx, you know. Say, ah, if you don't like the, my ideas, I got other ones. <laughs> yeah. So we can talk about other other focus if you'd like to. But uh, that was the answer. I had a question at that point, and that was about what? How do you explain this sort of subtle sense of dualism, this arisingness mm -hmm. that seemed to happen, when it's not supposed to be, you know, supposed to be non-dual. So there's more to cover. There's more to go. So Atmananda was able to answer that question. He was your bridge for that. Yeah, yeah he was my bridge for that. Yeah. I see. Yeah, and that was in Atma Darshan, which is, there's something about, sort of problematic about that text, and that is that um, the publisher doesn't let people talk about it too openly for copyright violations. Oh, I see. So if uh, people quote passages from it, they'll get a letter, a takedown letter. Oh. Look on the internet or something. I mean, you can you can t voice it verbally, but you just can't put it in writing or print or even on a even on an interview you know, like this. Yeah. An interview like this, I think, because the interview is um, something you could download and sure, repeat. Yeah. Then, if you gave a long quotation, or if I read a passage, or verbatim, about, if you, yeah. verbatim, right, right, right. So uh, that's why there's you don't hear more spoken about with hmm. Atmananda. Most of the people who have some kind of Atmananda mention on their websites have mm -hmm. heard from the publishers. Oh, he's a foolish publisher because that would popularize it and people would probably buy more <laughs> books. But yeah. It's true. 
<laughs> I had some commentaries and stuff like that. They told me to take them down, and I did. Huh. Yeah. So um, <coughs> here's a question that I always ask people towards the end of an interview, and it's, it's interesting to get their answers. Um, but um, do you feel that in, in your own experience, and you know, again, please bear with me in terms of the limitations of the terminology, but is, is there... Um, a, a continuous growth in some dimension or deepening or or clarification i mean uh, or is there sort of a static finality to your experience and it doesn't seem like any new ground is broken anymore oh that's a really interesting question um from i'd have to choose a way to talk about it uh huh well take a stab at it like from once uh everything is consciousness and consciousness is all there is mm -hmm. that's it <clears throat> then you have to go somewhere else conversationally to start talking about anything. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's actually, if you take that as, at its word, that's the last word. And where can you go if everything is consciousness? Right. Right. So I actually had that question as well. <coughs> um, what can you do with this? So I started looking around and reading, being kind of an intellectual kind of person. I started looking at different ways of talking about talking. Mm -hmm. different ways of explaining why it's not a violation of non-duality to talk about stuff. Right. And so I looked into, you know, a lot of things about language and stuff, and I looked into the emptiness teachings as well, which had always interested me, even when I was studying the, along the lines of um, Advaita and non-duality that way, I was looking into the emptiness teachings, you know, the, the classic Buddhist Madhyamaka teachings. Mm -hmm. And they have... Um, a lot to say along these lines, a lot, 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 and um, so I did. I did more growth and sort of learning and and metabolizing of that kind of viewpoint, and that sort of came at a time, kind of a handy time too, because over the last three or four years, I've been studying that for like twelve, fifteen years. But after, the, in the last three or four years, I've noticed that there have been people who've written to me and some other teachers I've heard from who don't grok the whole consciousness notion. Hmm. The oneness, consciousness, <clears throat> awareness is the basis of all things. They don't get it. They don't, it just doesn't strike a chord with them. And so, what can you do? I mean, if they're interested in the sort of the fruits, the lack of suffering, you know, the, the ending my suffering, the ending of... Um, you know, having having such a jumpy, anxious mind that I can't think straight, they want to have relief from that. What can you do when non-duality has some pretty interesting, uh, pretty authoritative-sounding discourse about it? But if you don't grok the main idea, what can you do? Yeah. So maybe you're so, not their guy. Well, or, I mean, or, I don't think myself you're going to say someone's you're... guys. I I became a different guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's other teachings. Yeah, yeah. And so I've been sort of teaching people the emptiness teachings, the Buddhist okay. emptiness teachings. And in that teaching, it's okay to talk about everything, including your question about continual growth. Mm -hmm. There's a way that, that sort of um, within the bed of that teaching, there's room for that. There's no room for that. I remember a friend of mine asked one of the non-dual teachers at the SAM conference, um, is there any end? He was, it was a trick question. Mm -hmm. Is there any end to the consciousness notion? Mm -hmm. Does it remain something that is always there? Like, is it always something that is going to be part of your language from the rest, you know, from then on? And the person said, well, yes, it is, because if it ever disappeared, it, that disappearance would have to happen in consciousness. Mm. <clears throat> and so that sort of seemed like a sort of uh, maybe a rigidity in one's attitude towards language. Hmm. I mean, could there be other ways to talk about this stuff? You know? I mean, like you said, House of Many Mansions, and one of, one of, the, uh, one of the mansions would be this other teaching that I have started to, to help people with, is emptiness teaching. And basically, that one um, allows for lots and lots and lots and lots of um, continual growth with no, the only end point really is full Buddhahood, which no mm -hmm. human being has accomplished, you know? Yeah. So it leaves lots of, it, it basically takes the pressure off everybody and leaves lots of growth for for anyone. So That's like, interesting. You know, like, the, you've heard of the uh, Zen teachers and the, 
the perhaps the uh, Vipassana teachers who said, after 20 years of teaching meditation, I needed psychotherapy. No, I had not heard of that. Uh, I've had I've heard of people who had been teachers for a long time or something who ended up needing psychotherapy or flipping out, but um, I hadn't heard that specific reference that you just gave. There was a Zen teacher in one of the um, Joseph Goldstein, I think maybe was mm -hmm. one of the the Vipassana teachers. You know, the insight meditation teachers. So. Have you ever heard of a non-dualist or a satsang teacher who has actually had something like that happen and has integrated that into their teaching? <coughs> it um, would be like almost. <coughs> yeah, I know there are teachers who are just very uh, all-embracing and who would recommend it and and so on. Um, but, but I can't say you wouldn't find anybody who said I am consciousness and oh yeah, then I needed psychotherapy. Yeah, I mean, not so much. Or not, there's no room. What I'm saying is, I'm, I'm making actually a point about the discourse, not mm -hmm. about the person. Right. There's no room in the discourse for that to be spoken of. Yeah. Because there's no after. Right. I know that you know there I are teachers like, like for people. instance, Adya Shanti is you know, very open about this. He says, "Oh, maybe you need psychotherapy. Maybe you need drugs." Yeah, you know, but he, would he say that he ever needed it? No, he probably wouldn't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. I'm saying. I've known lots of teachers who've gone to resources like that, but it never mm -hmm. ends up being part of the teaching. Yeah. But in that other teaching, you know, there's room for it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So what I'm making is a, not about people, but about about the discourse and what resources the discourse actually gives you to work with stuff. It's interesting that you are able to put on the different hats of you know slightly different teaching methods rather than just referring people to that you know saying go 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 to that rather you know you're saying okay I'll I'll teach you that well some things I yeah some if person wants to learn about um, I've had a lot of people ask for something I was not qualified at all to teach them and that was um, Kundalini yoga sure so you just referred them to somebody or whatever yeah 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 <clears throat> um I've had several people that I've interviewed who told me that earlier in life, bef sometimes before they even got on to any kind of interest in spirituality, they actually had an experience where Ramana Maharshi came to them, and they, and they didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. but they had this vision. They'd be walking down the street or sitting in their bedroom or whatever, Ramana Maharshi would come, and they'd think, whoa, what is this? And then maybe 10 years later, they'd be in a bookstore and see, a, see his picture and then get interested. And, and So I find that interesting. I think it's, it's I, I wonder what's actually happening there. Um, I wonder whether you know, Ramana Maharshi in some way, shape, or form is is still an entity that is kind of coming to trigger people's evolution or something. And I'm wondering what you would say about that and what you would say about what you expect to happen to Greg Good after this body dies. Mm. Mm. Um, I don't really have anything to say about that. Uh, no, nothing like that has ever happened to me. Right. As like talking from the viewpoint of a person. Mm -hmm. I've never had that kind of thing. <clears throat> and there's also something that is kind of tricky with that, that those reports always come after they know about Ramana Maharshi. Well, no, so that several people didn't. You know, they, who's this Indian guy? In fact, there's this one woman. She's she, breaking she, up again. Uh, I think it's recording okay. So okay. As long, as long I, can, as I can, just can't hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Um, there's this one woman. She was rather young at the time. She just had this fervent desire for truth. She, she sat on the edge of her bed and said, I want... No, you know, I just demand that some, whoever knows the truth come through this door. And then she uh -huh. kind of went to bed. She woke up in the middle of the night, and Ramana Maharshi was sitting on her bed. Uh -huh. She didn't know who the heck it was. She threw a pillow at him, <laughs> and, and yeah, didn't, I, I didn't, read that. didn't discover until years later who he actually was. Is that someone in India? No, it was an American. Someone I interviewed. I forget which person it was. Oh, I know it who it was. Uh, Pamela Wilson. Yeah, Pamela. Pamela. Yep. yep. There you go. Well, if I mean, if um. If someone can appear at one point, why can't they appear at another point? Like if, if, if you look into physicality and you can't find physicality, mm -hmm. you can't find a true physical locus for like personhood. You can't find a molecule. If you really, really look, you can't find uh, something that is brutally physical with no sentience and no, no awareness attached to it at all. So if that's the case, why should Ramana Maharshi only be able to appear like later in life rather than earlier in life? Why would he mm. only be able to appear in the physical sense and not in the uh, subtle sense? Right. What, what, yeah. uh, I see no limitations to that at all. Yeah. Well, it kind of harkens back to what we were saying about Quan Yin. Uh, is that the right pronunciation? Yeah, Quan Yin. Um, 
if there can be cups, why can't there be Kuan Yin? Why can't yeah, there be no, you know, yeah. subtle phenomena? It's totally open. It's totally, yeah. Yeah, it's totally open. In fact, that was one of the ways that I sort of started learning Advaita Vedanta. I was in, interested in why so many people were so convinced about these levels and these layers and these subtle entities when it, it had not been part of my childhood or my adolescent or my college teaching at all. Right. So I looked into it a great deal, and I took some classes in in like clairvoyant, you know, clairvoyant training and stuff like that. I did really well at it, and I thought, yeah, this, you know, th this, yeah, there's no nothing to object to. It's it's if it's as real as a cup, you know. Yeah. So that leads me back to the question, um, and this may maybe you regard this as a frivolous question. I don't know, but uh, do you feel that? when you die, when Greg dies, mm -hmm. um, there will be any continuation of some uh, seed of individuality uh, or uh, as if, as is apparently the case with Ramana Maharshi, if, if those people's accounts are true, or do you feel like that it's the old sort of drop into the ocean thing and that's it for, you know, or is this just a kind of philosophical speculation that you can't really touch? Um. These are all parts of orthodox teachings. Like these yeah. questions and the answers to them are all part of the orthodox teachings. Mm -hmm. And what the orthodox teachings say is that <clears throat> before realization, there will be some kind of continuity. Mm. And they have different ways of talking about what, what's responsible for the continuity and where it will go. Mm -hmm. And after realization, that continuity stops. Like for Advaita Vedanta, it stops altogether. Mm that then the drop drop goes back into the ocean, stops mm -hmm. being a drop, because it doesn't think of itself as a drop anymore. Right. And in Buddhism, um, it stops being a drop unless you want to continue as a drop to help other drops. The bodhisattva thing. Right. Yeah. Huh. So those are the orthodox answers, and then there are the, you know, what I would call the deflationary non-dual answers, like uh, Nisargadatta would say um, to people in certain questions, you know, according to the question, he would say, well, wh what makes that continuity yours? Hmm. So what makes you think that even if there is a linkage, that it would have anything to do with you? Yeah. So in other words, like don't worry about that stuff. Yeah. You know, it does seem a little bit of a phenomenal chain, you know, uh -huh. that happens. So uh, to t t to talk about this question to me doesn't seem like it's independent of of adopting one of those discourses. You know. And you and you have no particular uh, intuitive insight into it yourself, aside from traditional teachings that you've read or anything like that yeah because I how could you I, I don't see a possible way for me to to detach my intuition from mm -hmm. some traditional teaching okay like, it's not the kind of question I usually ask it seems a little esoteric and maybe even frivolous but I just for some reason I was curious as to how you would answer it <laughs> yeah I well I think that the I did have intuitions along that line before mm-hmm uh, when I was really inquiring along these things, yeah. along the lines of these things, <clears throat> and it seemed to me that the difference between one arising and the next arising was very analogous to the distinction between one life and the next life. Hmm. So in other words, um, one arising, it arose, and then it subsided back to that global witnessing awareness. Then another arising came. So its home is awareness. It never gets like detached from awareness it's nothing other than awareness so then you talk about the arising is that second arising the same as the first or is it different hmm. like how would you talk about that and so that for me that pacified the whole question of what happens after I die mm -hmm. is that different from deep sleep like can you really ask that question seriously unless you think you're the same person on Tuesday that, as you were on Monday like I hadn't thought that for decades, that yeah. I, I'm the same today as I was yesterday. So the question really is the same. You can sort of collapse that into what happens in deep sleep. Like to what extent am I there? Do you have any f experience of your body or your mind during deep sleep? No. By definition, no. no. So you have no way of saying that the, even the world is there when you wake up. How do, how do you know it's not a new world? So that's very analogous to being what happens after you die hmm. so you know between every thought I die between every day the deep sleep I die and the per that that which arises next is neither the same 
nor totally different hmm. from that which went before. Cool. Okay. Um, That's a conversation stopper. <laughs> it is. I mean, I you know, I could keep badgering you with all kinds of little questions that come to mind, but I think we've I covered a lot of ground. Yeah, fun talking. Yeah, I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And, and you know, I find you particularly enjoyable to talk to because you're not afraid of, I mean, you don't have the sort of monolithic uh, message. You're, you're not afraid of exploring. You, you have explored so many things in your life so far, and uh, I think it kind of made you what you are as a as an exponent of knowledge, somebody who is kind of like malleable and flexible and open to all kinds of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. I value. I think that's good. I, I I'm glad you said that. I I value that. Um, I think it's useful. It's helpful, and it sort of speaking as a person, it feels good. Yeah. It feels good to not have a barrier with like a person or an approach that that confronts you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always there's always a, a an engagement, you know. Yeah, no, I feel like you're one of the most non-fundamentalist people I've ever spoken with. Um, you know, I mean, there are plenty of fundamentalist, non-dual people around. There are. Uh, it becomes its own religion. It yeah. really does. Yeah. And, and they yeah. get they get into these heated arguments with each other and so on, and you know, <laughs> defending their particular flavor of it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. yeah. Anyway, but that's life. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Greg. Okay. This, this well, has you. been great. I'm glad we finally got it together to do this. And thank you for pushing me to get better equipment because, um, well, made this better and maybe I'll, I'll interview you someday. Great. People keep saying somebody should. I don't think it'll be as interesting as my having interviewed you. Uh, I think you, you've got a lot more. Well, lot I, more. Know. I know. Like, I'm, you know, I could dig. We could dig. <laughs> who knows? All right, we'll do that sometime. How many you got? You've got like how many hundreds do you have? Oh, oh how many have I done? But I think you're like 103 or something like that. You're number 103. Okay. And then yeah. there's the part of you that is not the interviewer, which is your own your own exploration. Right. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. So. Huh. Yeah. We'll do that. Well, you said you were thinking of starting an interview show, right? Yeah, something along the lines of that emptiness teaching. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, more and more people had been interested in that approach because mm -hmm. it. There's a lack of fundamentalism about it. Yeah, and I so, think that's um, good. And people sort of maybe maybe like I've noticed that some people who used to talk about awareness as the mm -hmm. basis, like using that word awareness, mm -hmm. don't mention that word anymore. Hmm. Like um, I think have they the, substituted the, another word for it? Yeah, the great freedom folks. Now it's clarity. It used to be awareness. Hmm. Now yeah. it's clarity. Think well, that's kind of like, interesting because awareness sounds like more like an object. And it does. Clar clarity it's, sounds more like a quality. Yeah, it sounds like a real thing, like awareness. And yeah. plus, it's um, it's sort of, you know, when scientists talk about that awareness and consciousness, they key it like to an individual biological entity, like right each, to the brain. Each yeah. one has their own awareness. Right. So um, yeah. So maybe the you know maybe the time for that word is kind of like you know, past. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Well, if you end up doing uh. Your own interview show and interviewing various people. I'll be sure to tell people about it and link to it and so on. Okay. I think I think that my viewers will be interested in hearing it. Good, good, good. All right. All right. Thanks. So let me just make a couple of concluding remarks. Um, those of you who have hung in with us this far, you have been watching or listening to uh, uh, ep an interview with Greg Good, and uh, Greg lives in the New York City area. Is a, I guess we could say a, a non-dual teacher and. Um, and you are available for consultations so they can go to your website if uh, they like and I'll be linking to that from batgap.com and through that they can get in touch with you and uh, set up an appointment if they'd like to do a consultation um, yeah I have less time to do face-to-face -face and verbal ones but uh, email I have lots of time for email and then email questions are free oh, okay There's great. No, nothing uh, don't charge money you know. cool well, your email address is right on your site. It's greg at heartofnow.com, and yeah. uh, people can go there. They'll see it. And um, I imagine you'll get some uh, some input as a cool. result of this interview. Cool. All right. So um, I just want to uh, – a couple more concluding remarks, and then I'll let you go. Just that those who are watching, if you go to batgap.com, which you may not be at. You, may, you might be on YouTube. You might be listening to an audio file. But if you go there, you'll see all the interviews archived. And there you can sign up for a newsletter notification. Each time I put up a new interview, you'll get an email. Uh, you can also participate in a chat group that e evolves around each interview. And uh, 
there's a donate button if your finger gets itchy you can click on that um, and that's about it so thanks for watching and we will see you next week should be Lisa Carnes next week from Australia if things go as planned okay thank you Rick thanks Greg okay see you later talk to you later bye